Censorship in Nazi Germany On the evening of May 10, 1933, a crowd of 40,000 Germans gathered in Berlin's Opera Square to listen to a speech by one of Hitler's closest advisors, Germany's Minister of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels. The speech was to mark an important event. Germany's universities had long been a hotbed of National Socialism, and students had decided that one way to demonstrate their support for the Nazi regime was through public burning of blacklisted works, or those whose authors were considered unsavory by the state. There were claims at the time that the burnings were a spontaneous uprising on the part of the students in support of Nazi ideals, but this was a lie. They were, in fact, carefully planned and executed by the National Socialist German Students' Union. In the weeks leading up to the burning, libraries around the country were raided and purged of so-called questionable material. Works by Jewish authors such as Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein were obvious targets. Also singled out were Marxist communist texts and works by foreign authors like Ernest Hemingway, Jack London, and Helen Keller, the American writer who miraculously overcame being born deaf-blind to champion the rights of the disabled. Certain institutions, such as Magnus Hirschfeld's Institute of Sexology, that were deemed contrary to the ideals of the Third Reich, also witnessed their collections devastated. In that particular case, the institute was raided, staff members were attacked, and thousands of books and papers were stolen and added to the piles of those that were to be burnt. It's also believed that in the attack, Dora Richter, the first documented person to undergo gender reassignment surgery, was killed. The Institute, an extremely progressive research and treatment center which provided support and care for the homosexual community, including path-breaking gender reassignment surgeries, never recovered, and the loss of such a huge volume of irreplaceable research set the field of gender studies back by decades. The Berlin book burning is believed to have begun at the Friedrich Wilhelm University, where the professor of political pedagogy, Alfred Bayumla, ended his inaugural lecture with an incitement for the students to stop waiting for book bannings to come into effect, and instead to take action and burn any un-German books themselves. In the evening, students loaded tens of thousands of books onto trucks and began a torchlit procession to the square, where to the accompaniment of SS and SA bands playing German folk music, they erected bonfires. The speech Goebbels gave that night has become known as the Feuerrede, or fire speech. In it, he proclaimed that the Jewish intellectualism was dead and that, quote, the soul of the German people can again express itself. These flames not only illuminate the final end of an old era, they also light up the new, end quote. Goebbels was met with an overwhelming support from the watching crowd, and when he finished speaking, they began a rendition of the Horst Wessel song, the Nazi anthem. All the while, the books continued to burn. Similar demonstrations took place in universities across Germany, both on the night of the 10th and over the weeks that followed. The book burnings, which took place in 1933, were not the first instance of Nazi censorship, and they were certainly not the last, but they were among the most theatrical. The photographs taken on that night, depicting thousands of books that represented the dreams, stories, and ideals of previous generations and so-called undesirables, being turned to ashes while surrounded by a Hitler-saluting crowd can be viewed as some of the most visceral and powerful examples of censorship in action. They remain a chilling reminder to this day. Although Hitler did not become chancellor until 1933, Nazi attempts to control and manipulate the population began several years before that. Berlin in the 1920s was one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world, despite having to deal with the deprivation caused by the aftermath of World War I. It became a center for the arts and for gay culture. Women were increasingly becoming part of the workforce rather than remaining at home, and there was even the beginnings of a gay rights movement. Jewish people, too, saw unprecedented freedoms throughout this period. Jewish writers, painters, and musicians increasingly rose to the forefront, and new professions from which Jewish people were previously barred were opened up to them. There was, for example, a Jewish foreign minister of Germany named Walther Rathenau, an appointment that would have been unthinkable under the previous Hohenzollern dynasty. As is often the case with progressive societies, there was a strong backlash among some enclaves of the population and within the political sphere itself. 
Throughout the Weimar period, older Germans of both the right and the left became increasingly concerned about what they saw as the degradation of society and the move away from traditional German culture. But now, let's take a moment to thank our sponsor Magellan TV. Start your journey with the impressive documentary streaming service Magellan TV, containing over 3,000 documentaries covering history, science, space, and more, with many available in 4K high def. If you'd like to learn more about World War II and its heroic figures, stream their new release, Eagles of Mercy. Witness the amazing story about two young American medics with the 101st Airborne Screaming Eagles that ended up trapped in a 12th century Norman church in the small village of Engelville au They made Herculean efforts to help save lives on D-Day as the liberation of Western Europe began. Magellan TV is offering Simple History viewers a one-month free trial to stream Eagles of Mercy and the rest of their extensive history collection. Click the link in the description to start your one-month free trial today. In the late 1920s, the National Socialist Society for German Culture, later known as the Militant League for German Culture, or KFDK, was formed. While this did not begin as an official Nazi organization, its founder was Alfred Rosenberg, a Nazi ideologue who planned on using his organization as a means to impose the core tenets of National Socialism on German culture. Throughout the early 1930s, the KFDK was responsible for the publishing of several periodicals which decried degenerate art, particularly the modernist art movement, and attacked institutions and individuals whom they had declared their enemies. One particular prominent member who had direct political influence was Wilhelm Frick. In 1928, Frick became one of the first members of the Nazi party to be officially elected to the Reichstag. As his influence and popularity grew, in 1930 Frick was appointed Minister of the Interior and Education of Thuringia, making him the first member of the Nazi party to hold high office within the Reichstag. He immediately set about banning books, symphonies, and movies that opposed the spirit of National Socialism, including Universal Studios, all quiet on the Western Front. This he did while simultaneously issuing racial and political decrees against the so-called enemies of the German national tradition. He also created a mandatory list of national literature, which had to be carried by all libraries. When the Nazis completed their rise to power in 1933, Frick's service was not forgotten, and he was appointed Minister for the Interior of Nazi Germany in Hitler's first official cabinet. In the years that follow, he would play a pivotal role in the regime through his work in implementing the infamous Nuremberg Laws and was a leading advocate of Germany's eugenics campaign. In an effort to quickly and efficiently consolidate their power, the Nazi party infamously established the Ministry for Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. Hitler recognized Goebbels' genius in these matters, and the new department was essentially created with him in mind. It was through his work within the ministry that the Nazis were able to gain total control over all aspects of German media and creative expression, molding public opinion in a process known as Nazification, or Gleichschaltung. In September of the same year, Goebbels created the Reichskulturkammer, or Reich Chamber of Culture. Seven subchambers were then set up to deal with the different aspects of the art and media, film, literature, fine arts, broadcasting, music, the theater, and the press. Anyone who wanted to work with any of these disciplines was required to be a member of its respective chamber. This allowed the ministry to have complete control over the country's artistic and journalistic output and to silence any dissenting voices. Members of a chamber were forced to follow strict measures if they wished to continue working within their chosen field, such as requesting permission to leave the country for work. At the time the Nazis took control, Germany had around 4,700 periodicals in circulation, the vast majority of which were not loyal to the new regime. Germany becoming a one-party system unsurprisingly led to the closure of a number of these new outlets, particularly the more politically motivated, as laws and underhand deals designed to Aryanize businesses witnessed a dramatic thinning of the field by the time the Reich press chamber was established. There remained plenty of work to be done, however, to ensure the destruction of the free press. The Editor's Law of October 4, 1933 forbade Jews or anyone who was married to a Jew from working in the press. 
Daily instructions were handed down by the ministry to newspapers dealing what stories they could tell and how they could tell them. Failure by any editor or journalist to comply with these instructions could result in them losing their jobs or, in extreme cases, their admittance to a concentration camp. In simple terms, it was strictly forbidden to publish anything that would be seen to weaken the strength of the Reich. Goebbels was particularly interested in the use of the relatively new technology of radio as a means to spread propaganda throughout the populace. At the time, radio stations within Germany were nationalized and controlled by the post office, who owned the national broadcasting company and collected license fees from households that owned a radio set. These circumstances meant that it was relatively easy for Goebbels to seize control of the entire network and bring it under the auspices of the ministry. From there, it was simply a matter of firing anyone deemed unpatriotic and replacing them with those loyal to the party. Through these means, the Nazis secured a direct mouthpiece right into the homes of millions of German citizens. Undisputed control of the radio also allowed Goebbels to steer the German population away from what he considered decadent influences, such as jazz music, which was forbidden during the Nazi regime. During the war years, censorship measures became even stricter. On September 2, 1939, it became illegal to listen to foreign radio stations. Anyone caught sharing information from foreign news broadcasts could expect to receive the death penalty. The need for paper rationing throughout this period also encouraged the Reich Chamber of Literature to increase regulations for publishers. From 1940 onward, they were required to provide advance notice of all books to be published and their respective authors. Works which could have been of use to the Allies, such as those that provided details of defensive capabilities, were also censored for obvious reasons. The only books originating from the enemy states that were allowed to be published were those that were purely scientific and whose authors had died before 1904 and were not Jewish. The Nazi desperation to control and curate all information that was available to the German public remained strong, even into the dying days of the regime. The final order banning a publication came as late as March 21, 1945, by which point Berlin was being reduced to rubble by Allied bombing, and the ultimate outcome of the war had long since been decided. The restriction in question made it illegal to distribute maps of 1 300,000 scale to public authorities. Helen Keller, in an open letter she wrote to Nazi students in 1933 after learning that her works were amongst those that had been burnt, wrote, History has taught you nothing if you think you can kill ideas. Tyrants have tried to do that often before, and the ideas have risen up in their might and destroyed them. It's interesting to note that the first time the word Holocaust, which literally means a burnt offering, was used in connection with the Nazis was in relation to the book burnings. This is particularly poignant when considering the words of 19th century German Jewish writer Heinrich Heine, who wrote, where they burn books, they will also ultimately burn people.